thank you, Lloyds, and um, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, I know that this week is a very busy week for almost everyone, so I really appreciate your uh, showing up this afternoon. Uh, before we start, I would just like to apologize for uh, the change in venue. Uh, at first, uh, it was announced that this that the long hall would be the venue, and then uh, a few days after, uh, it was announced that it would be uh, Umali Auditorium uh, downstairs. And then uh, just yesterday, and then uh, there has been a change. So we are very sorry for the change but it just also dawned on me this morning that I think it's really uh, something coincidental and prophetic because uh, Rilon, uh, the late J.B. Rilon, who was the director of CIRCA, is the father of the father of Philippine Abbey business. So I think uh, no, um, it was really meant to be that I present here. Also, I would just like to share some trivia about agribusiness. Just this morning, I saw um, it was one of the emails in my inbox because I usually get updates from IFAMA, which is the International Food and Agribusiness Management Association. Uh, it was announced in one of their emails that uh, they will be awarding Dr. Ray Goldberg uh, the Annual Distinguished Service Award of IFAMA. And Dr. Ray Goldberg, uh, together with Dr. John Davis, uh, they were actually the ones who started the field of agribusiness. They were the ones who developed the agribusiness program at the Harvard Business School. So I just found it also very coincidental that today that I'm going to present to you something and I'm going to represent our department and the field of agribusiness. I just found it coincidental that Dr. Ray Goldberg, who, who together with Dr. John Davis coined the word agribusiness, uh, is also to receive an annual Distinguished Service Award. So uh, there are a lot of coincidences today, but I think these are really uh, meant to be coincidences. So with that as introduction, I would like to proceed with the lecture for this afternoon. So this is the topic that I chose. It is climate change adaptation strategies of agribusiness enterprises in the Philippines. Uh, okay. At any rate, this is the, this should be the first slide. Um, there was uh, I think it went to uh, the fourth no to the fourth slide. At any rate, what I want to tell with you as my introduction is that. Much has been written about how climate change will affect the physical environment and how governments and local communities should respond. However, the responses of agribusiness enterprises, both large and SMEs, small and medium enterprises, have not received the same attention. So, this is the reason which motivated me to work on this topic. Also, even under current climate variability, and extreme weather events, large as well as SMEs in the agribusiness sector have not been adequately recognized as an affected sector, and therefore, appropriate structures and processes have not been developed for these enterprises. And I would also like to uh, share with you that just this March, Oxfam in Asia advertised this call for somebody to work on a scoping study on private sector resilience to disaster and climate risk in Vietnam, which for me also somehow uh, proves that this topic of mine is also timely. And uh, it has an objective similar to my objective, and that is to undertake an analysis of current practices of major agribusiness producers in terms of re resilience to disaster and climate risk and to identify the possible entry points for Oxfam to work with the private sector. Just to still further prove that it is really um, very uh, good to study the risk for disaster of the business sector, 
uh, this framework for disaster resilience planning for agriculture came out. So it was by the Queensland Farmers Federation, and they emphasized that a resilient agricultural sector would understand the risk for disaster at the business, industry, and community level, and that there should be no, this target of minimizing the risk of business loss, infrastructure damage, and environmental degradation. What also prompted me to work on this topic is that I read that although there are quite a number of companies who understand that they face climate-related impacts, only around 30% are actually uh, responding to these threats. And what are the barriers? So these are just but some of the barriers to business engaging in climate change adaptation, their lack of awareness and understanding of the diverse business risks from climate change, especially the indirect risk, uncertainty about the effectiveness and cost of adaptation measures, and the lack of economic analysis of the various adaptation options available to business, and the lack of effective strategic management frameworks which take into account emerging long-term risks such as climate change. Um, I'm also interested in the resilience of SMEs because uh, based on my research, the SMEs are really more vulnerable compared to the large enterprises. So I found this interesting finding on the adaptive cap capacity of Australian SMEs. And this study found that none of the SMEs had formal business continuity plans, and their business planning horizon was only from two to five years. Plus, most of these SMEs adopted uh, adaptive strategies, which are not necessarily considered as climate adaptation strategies. So these are the objectives of my lecture. The lecture will describe the impact of climate change manifestations on Philippine agribusiness industries and enterprises and provide an overview of their current climate change adoption strategies. Specifically, I will discuss the impact of climate change on agribusiness industries in the Philippines as well as selected Southeast Asian countries, describe the coping mechanisms of agribusiness enterprises to climate change, describe how selected sustainable enterprises in the Philippines attempted to integrate climate change in their business strategies and present ways by which agribusiness enterprises can incorporate climate change in their core business functions and how support institutions can help enable the former to effectively respond to climate change risks. So to start the the discussion of the results, and the, most of this came from review of literature, i.e. the metasynthesis of a relevant literature on the impact of uh, climate change on agribusiness industries and enterprises. So I encountered this book by a well-known agribusiness proponent, um, Dr. D, and uh, he mentioned in his new book that these are the following, uh, these are the manifestations of climate change. Extreme rains and outbursts that result in, ex in severe flooding, increasing frequency of extreme events, typhoons and droughts, uh, higher temperatures, and rapid sea rise. And uh, there was mention that uh, this will affect rice and other crops, especially in the Philippines and Vietnam, and that long drought and high temperature will affect the water salinity in fish ponds and water supply in freshwater ponds. So these are the business fees associated with climate change. This is a typology of the business fees. Uh, this to core business operations. So you will get an idea of this later when I give you my uh, mini case results. The risk to the value chain and then risk to local communities, especially the income on the labor force, which is related also to the risk from economic and social changes, like uh, political conflicts and peace and security problems, 
uh, in the case of um, shutdowns, no? shutdowns in operations of farms affected by extreme weather events. I also encountered this um, classification of the different impacts of disaster on agriculture. So it's mentioned here that there are direct, indirect, intangible, regional impacts, and on a positive note, there's also a potential for positive impact. So these are considered to uh, cover all the impacts of disasters on agriculture. I, um, in recent uh, years, have been working on some food security um, researches, and uh, I was encouraged by CIRCA because they made me an adjunct fellow. So I tried to also relate uh, the climate change risks you know, with the food security elements. And I found that it's not only in terms of availability that there's this effect of climate change, but also access. Whenever there's infrastructure damage, there's an effect on physical access. And for economic access, the effect on the loss of income and employment opportunities. And uh, I also found that there's also an effect on stability, which, and this occurs when there's increased livelihood risk. And then uh, we have to consider uh, pressure on food prices and feed prices. And uh, this will lead to dependence on food imports. And then there's also this effect on utilization. Climate change indirectly will have an effect on utilization in the form of human health risks and nutrition. So I also encountered this matrix which uh, tries to provide the different business risks and the vulnerable industry sectors. So I just try to focus on the agribusiness related sectors. So in the area of logistics, for example, the more vulnerable are those in retailing uh, for the risk related to physical assets and business premises. The more vulnerable are all sectors, so agriculture and forestry included, and the real estate, which somehow can also be related to agribis. And then in the area of efficiency of operations, the more vulnerable to this type of risk is the food industry, and manufacturing, which is also partially a part of manufacturing, is part of agribusiness. And then, in the area of competition over resources, uh, there's this uh, risk to the food and beverage sector, especially where water is concerned. For financial drivers, which is related to risk related to increase in operational costs and business continuity costs the more vulnerable agribusiness related sector is agriculture and forestry. For increased insurance costs, all sectors are vulnerable. For changing markets, again, all sectors, but there's this uh, special impact on the retail sector. For the workforce, all sectors are vulnerable. And lastly, for loss of biodiversity, I highlighted fisheries and tourism because there's ugly ecotourism. So these are the more vulnerable agribusiness sectors where this type of risk is concerned. I would also like to share with you a nice um, value chain. Uh, it's the representation of the value chain approach to identifying climate change risks and opportunities. Uh, so the, the thicker circle that uh, represents risk and then the, the thinner circle is the opportunity. So like when you're talking of support resources and business environment, there are opportunities for those who provide finance and insurance. So in particular, uh, it's possible that new sources of adaptation finance can be designed and provided in the area of policy environment it's possible that there can be this identification of um, areas of synergy between public and private adaptation actions or initiatives. In the area of, or 
in relation to stakeholder expectations, one possible opportunity is that of the improved reputation of the company when it effectively responds to climate change. And the stakeholders uh, will appreciate this. And then uh, in connection with the uh, functions, which is also part of the value chain, but uh, they are considered as primary activities, but they go beyond the business fence lines like uh, community and economic resilience. The opportunity of, or I'll take first the risk, there's this risk in terms of damage to ecosystems important to business. Uh, but there's this opportunity like better social economic conditions for local communities and the improvement of business stability. Now, of course, for raw material sourcing, we are all aware that with climate change, there can be this risk in terms of availability of the input, and this will also result to commodity price volatility, the, the volatility of the price using that input. And I'll show an example later on. Now, for distribution, for logistics, of course, climate triggered disruptions to distribution networks is the risk to this particular point of the value chain. And then for sales, there's this area of opportunity as well as risk, and that is changes in consumer preferences, consuming patterns, and seasonality. The, it can be both a risk as well as an opportunity. And lastly, for the major business functions, the core business functions, namely assets and infrastructure, and production and operations. One example of a climate related, climate change related risk is the failure to consider impacts during the design and planning of infrastructure could lead to asset and infrastructure damage and higher wear and tear and reduced use to life. And then for the production and operations, as you will also um, more appreciate later, uh, but for now, this is a listing of the climate change related risks and opportunities damage to existing uh, infrastructure and facilities, increased costs and or constraints. Uh, on industries relying heavily on water for production, increased health and safety hazards for workforce, and then a uh, risk and an opportunity, the effect of climate change on operations performance, quality, and timeliness, and improving the resilience of products and services could open markets. This is an opportunity. Okay, so this is the advantage of uh, using the value chain approach in identifying risks and opportunities associated with climate change. Uh, so this is a very nice uh, statement, so I did not change anything. So by considering how suppliers, communities, and governance add value to a company, a value chain approach to climate resilience provides a favorable framework with which to understand business risk from climate change to a company's product supply, community engagement, and government relations. And these are the specific trends, trends of the value chain approach, which I would really like to propose in my lecture this afternoon. Uh, first, through the value chain approach, you can analyze vulnerability to climate change for each link and identify hotspots for this across the whole value chain. Also, you can assess risk for each link individually, taking into account how different impacts can have a compounded or accumulative effect. Also, you can identify opportunities for new markets with the value chain approach. Also, uh, you can identify opportunities to build climate resilience across the whole value chain with the links in the value chain uh, helping one another. And then lastly, there can be this implementation of climate resilience actions in partnership with those who can mutually benefit from them. So this is just to illustrate why it is very important to adopt a climate uh, a value chain approach when trying to address climate change. 
during Thailand's extreme flooding in 2011, there were 26 out of 77 provinces which were badly affected. So there were, there were quite a number of firm shutdowns. And uh, if I remember correctly, um, this is not actually activist, but there are implications to the agribusiness sector. But these provinces are, are provinces where there are assembly, assembly uh, flats for Honda, Toyota, and other car manufacturers. So 3,000 SMEs were forced to shut down during Thailand's extreme flooding. And this extreme flooding case is the insurance industry's highest ever recorded flood loss event. And over 14,500 companies reliant on Thai suppliers suffered business disruptions worldwide. So the effect really became global. No? So this is just to illustrate that uh, we should not only be concerned with addressing climate change in one country because um, there can be global implications if we do not address climate change risks. And in this case, there's this value chain risk which uh, led to spillover effects. And I got some data when I went to Davao. Uh, so I was given this data on the damage to agriculture after Typhoon Pablo and heavily damaged was Compostela Valley and Davao Oriental. So for crops alone, the damage was already 12 billion. And this 12 billion is, out of this 12 billion, 6.6 .6 billion is, uh, out of this 12 uh, billion, 8 billion pesos is already for bananas. No, because Compostela Valley is one of no, the, I think it is the country's um, banana growing um, area. So, no, uh, you will see later on more the damage as a result of Typhoon Pablo. But let's just say that in Compostela Valley, the damage to banana plantations already affected 12.5% of the Philippines yearly production of bananas. And there was this effect in terms, and this is why the value chain approach is really very important. Because as a result of problems in production and operations, there is the spillover effect on, on uh, marketing, international marketing in particular. That is, the exports to other countries do not be sustained because of the lack of supply. So I would just like to also mention that in Davao Oriental, which was also heavily affected by Typhoon Pablo, uh, the damage to livelihood was 6.68 billion. Okay, so and a total amount of 2.298 is needed for the reconstruction of the livelihood sector. So uh, just imagine how many years and how much it will cost not for there to, to, to reconstruct everything. Okay, and also just to give you more examples of uh, extreme climate change uh, destruction, uh, of course, I think you are well aware that during Typhoon Yolanda in 2013, uh, which is, and um, it affected Bantayan Island, which is the major egg-producing site in the Visayas. So 90% of the operations was very heavily affected. And um, there's this one enterprise, Franjora Farms, in Matridejos, whose daily production dropped by 60% since Yolanda struck. And uh, just to elaborate on the damage group, Groups of the chicken houses were all destroyed. Stressed chicken was sold for as low as 30 pesos, and some were even given for free. So it was, there was a, an opportunity, but at the same time, it was really a loss for those engaged in poultry production. So look at these pictures. You know, sorry to, to uh, make your afternoon sad. Uh, and you will see more pictures later on. But, uh, Look at this. Uh, this is in for banana, and then this is in uh, Compostela Valley, and then uh, 
this is for coconut. This is uh, coconut and palm. And then even fisheries was affected. And then an additional effect of climate change is I was able to talk with uh, somebody who, whose family won the Outstanding Farm Family Award during the Outstanding Farmer Awarding Ceremonies, uh, where I was a preliminary judge. And uh, this interviewee shared with me that uh, there was fish kill in Lake Cebu, South Cotabato. And uh, I got this statistic, 40 tons of tilapia with an estimated value of 4 million was damaged by fish eel. And the culprit is this kamahu. Kamahu uh, is uh, what they call, not uh, in our local language, that's what they call this phenomenon where sulfuric sediments accumulate in the lake's basin as a result of heavy rainfall, flooding, and erosion. So maybe later on, our discussion can also share something about this. Okay. I also got this nice uh, schematic diagram of climate change impact pathways to fisheries and aquaculture systems. So um, it just shows that uh, by the physical change from global warming can really lead to several changes and effects on different um, sectors and uh, the specific impacts are Okay, for broilers, so I looked at uh, some case studies in our department and I also looked at uh, graduate students' uh, researches and this was what I found that uh, for broilers, high temperature and humidity can actually lead to heat stress which can in turn lead to decreased feed consumption and total average and uh, lower average total like weight gain. No, so their daily weight gain will be affected. Plus, uh, another effect, and it, that's part of the value chain approach, is the effect of climate change on production input, specifically the price. And there was an interview we, um, we, we mentioned that uh, because of a drought in Brazil, and Brazil is the main source of soybeans of the country, uh, there was this erratic behavior of price. In 2011, per kilo it was 19 to 20. This is soya. No? And then in September 2012, after the drought in Brazil, it suddenly shot up to 35. Shot up to 35. And then in mid 2014, it again became 27 to 29. But still, it did not go down anymore to the level, not to the 2011 level. So this is how uh, climate change related events can also affect the other points in the value chain. Uh, there was also a study which my advisee and I conducted and this was among layer poultry farms in San Jose, Batangas, which is the uh, egg basket they say of the Philippines, but for now I think I will just say in the in the Luzon because there's one Thailand island. So at any rate, uh, these were the effects derived in relation to climate change manifestations. So a uh, chicken getting sick, uh, decrease in the number of eggs produced, increase in the feed price, delay in transport of eggs due to floods, and faster rate of egg spoilage. No? Because of the heat. Okay. And then for daily cattle, I was fortunate to also interview uh, Mr. Roberto Puente Espina. And later on, I will show you the results of uh, my interview in relation to their enterprise. But as a veterinarian, he mentioned that uh, one disease that he found that really proliferated. Uh, and he attributes it to climate change manifestations, Isura, which is a vector transmitted blood borne disease, which is spread by flies. And you know that flies usually come out after their rain, no? So, and this parasite has a negative influence on fertility and baby feeds. 
And then for swine, I tried to look at all the commodities, all the no, the, the all the commodity systems. So for swine, uh, one effect shared by Doc Fuente Espina to me was that after Typhoon Pablo, they were on a mission. No, they tried to help in the recovery. So they observed that most of the housing, the hoops of the housing of the pigs, really were blown away, which led to uh, the swine getting sunburned. And then uh, they also observed that, again, this is related to the value chain no? uh, effect, uh, farm to market roads, bridges, and other infrastructure really got damaged so that the animals could not be sold, the feeds got wet, and then no workers were reporting at that time because, of course, they had to attend to their own families. So these are uh, the list that I was uh, sharing with you earlier. They are being manifested in our agricultural commodities. For mango, uh, I saw this article about Imaras mango, which no, you, you all know that Imaras is known for its very delicious mango. But there's also the effect of um, erratic, the erratic climate pattern. So when it's supposed to be dry season, unfortunately in 2008 it was raining and the effect was that the mangoes became watery, sadly. And then uh, in terms of fertilization, they, the, the benefits from fertilization could not be optimized because it always rained. And uh, there was this value chain effect in terms of demand for mango seedlings. Uh, it decreased from 2007 to 2009. Now, I would like to shift gear to the adaptation strategies, some typologies of adaptation strategies. Uh, generally, these are the different uh, climate adaptation strategies, farm production practices, farm infrastructure related strategies, farm financial management strategies, technological development strategies, and government programs and insurance. So this is a listing. So I'll just take, uh, and you will see this later when I present to you my mini case results. So this one is a common farm production climate adaptation strategy, changing the crop variety and breed, and this one, change changing the timing of farm operations. For farm infrastructure, uh, installing under three irrigation systems, uh, installing a windmill to take advantage also of the strong winds, okay? And then uh, having uh, some structures, you need not uh, rely on very costly farm infrastructure like uh, you will see later on, uh, for bananas, they just use banana uh, bamboo poles, no? And then uh, also you can use mahogany as a windbreak. Uh, so there are cheaper options, no? And this all fall under farm infrastructure. For farm financial management, of course, crop insurance. But uh, there's this um, idea shared to me by. Uh, the research and development manager of La Pandai, who graduated from UPLB, Mrs. Fabregar, she said that uh, uh, the, most of the insurance available are really for typhoon, but actually they're not that particular about that. They're more concerned with strong winds, and there's no insurance product in relation to strong winds. So there has, so I think that's an area of opportunity also for those who are into insurance provision. Okay. And then other farm financial management um, strategies, diversify household income or diversify the, the sources of income of the business. So you will see that later. So there is also this set of uh, climate change adaptation strategies all related to technological developments. Developing drought, cold, heat tolerant crop varieties, and developing flood tolerant varieties. You will see examples also later. But this one, this is not only for the businesses themselves, they have to be helped by international organizations. And lastly, of course, there's the 
government programs and insurance. So these are the different climate change adaptation strategies. Uh, just to take an example, uh, there's this modified land and water resource management policies and programs to promote soil conservation and soil health management. That's one. And another example is uh, having weather-based decision-making. You will see that this is being done in Australia. Okay. So, uh, so as I said earlier, the first three categories are more for the enterprises. But the last two, the one related to government programs and insurance, and uh, the one related to technological developments, this requires the participation of public agencies and players in the agribusiness system. But of course, there can be cross-scale interactions. Okay, now for some secondary data, later on I'll present the primary data that I got, but this is the secondary data. Uh, just to give some examples that somehow our farmer entrepreneurs and, uh, and different agribusiness enterprises are responding to the climate change manifestation. So for rice, uh, there was this observation that the planting calendar of uh, rice farmers in Tarla, these are upland farmers, uh, change, no? From they used to plant May, but now they're planting June. And then they have also switched to early maturing varieties. For poultry, uh, there was a pattern where micro and small layer farm owners were concerned. Of course, they wanted cheaper climate change adaptation options. So they opted for changing the feeding schedule from daytime to nighttime, especially during the hot months. And then for feed formulation, they made use of their own innovative abilities and they formulated a low, a high density diet. They shifted from a high, from a low density diet to a high density diet. And for medium and large scale farms, because they could afford, they installed electronic funds. And uh, later on, I'll show some uh, cost benefit analysis of this uh, strategy. So this is an example of a chicken which is feeling very hot. Okay, so it is flapping its wings and it is exhibiting heat stress symptoms. So even chicken, oh, it's not only us. Okay. So, oh, this is one strategy in one country, I think this is Australia. Oh, they have these huge, large fans, okay? These fans pull the air, no? Uh, there are also uh, cooling fans. So, they pull the air, and this uh, air comes in, this cool air comes in through the cooling fans. And at the same time, these large fans push out the hot air. So this is what they are doing in Australia. So I was able to get some confidential information from a graduate student of ours who is connected with a big poultry and swine integrating integrator company in the Philippines. So this was what she confided to me. Uh, she said that for the pigs, what they do is to bat the broad hogs to prevent heat stress. And then for the chicken, uh, they have this climate control system. And um, so they do not load the chicken building more than its capacity. And there has to be this ratio. For every 36,000 chicken building capacity, the following should be the different equipments installed. 45 infrared heaters, four space heaters, and 12 lower fans. So they maintain this uh, ratio, which is part of their climate control system. And they also use curtain drops in the case in cases where the lower funds do not work. So this is uh, interesting. There is actually a there are progressive companies, agribusiness companies, where climate change adaptation is concerned. Now for cattle, oh, they have this uh, portable shed. Okay, that's to keep the herds 
body temperatures down during the hot months. And then uh, this is what I was telling about in Australia. They already create climate forecasting tools which can be used for forage crop and pasture decisions. And that uh, the local farmers are trained to make uh, to make use of the climate forecast uh, data. No, it is made usable to them. Okay, so and they based based on the, the forecasting tool that they come up with, they make their appropriate forage crop decisions. Plus, they also are able to estimate feed on offer the balance between pasture growth and the removal of pasture. So they are able to estimate this based on growth models using climate and soil data. So I also discovered in my search of different literature that the gut methods are also considered as climate change adaptation strategies. So it's hitting two birds with one. You are practicing good agricultural practices and at the same time, somehow you are also addressing climate change. So these were the most promising uh, practices. But it was, uh, it was mentioned that it is better to combine practices. Don't just rely on one practice. No, you have to reinforce one practice with another practice. Now for fruits and vegetables, these are just some climate change adaptation strategies using plastic mulching combined with drip irrigation and then uh, if, uh, for efficient uh, ventilation you have shading, fog cooling, heat pump and then this one is the most interesting using as alternative to summer vegetables tropical vegetables no? and this is being done in southern Japan so changing the breed no? Uh, again, uh, because this was this tropical fish was found to be more adapted to the climate. Okay, so this is just to present to you an example of uh, the adaptation of the value chain approach, but this time to a sector, the fisheries sector in Uganda. So, for every point on the value chain, there is the identification of an impact and then there are corresponding potential adaptation measures and then it is indicated uh, what, what sector should primarily take care of, the, of addressing the or implementing the potential adaptation measure. So like for inputs and services, for fisheries, there's the extreme exposure of inputs to extreme weather and winds. So that includes our boats, which are used to catch fish. And then for production, and you saw the cycle earlier, the, the, the dramatic representation. So there's a change in stream and groundwater temperature. So, um, and this is the potential adaptation measure, which is actually more of the responsibility of the government. And then for trade and transport, uh, there's this risk, roads and trade routes becoming impossible. So, Again, the government should address infrastructure provision. Although, I would like to also share that uh, La Panday, for example, uh, tried to do its share in terms of addressing infrastructure-related uh, adaptation strategies. Like, uh, um, Dr. Fabregar shared with me that uh, there was a dam which was broken uh, so uh, they could not wait for the LG to fix it, so they had it fixed. So that's just to illustrate that sometimes there has to be also private initiative. And she told me that they did it, La Panday did it, because uh, there would be soil erosion. No? They would have problems, so they took care of the problem. No? So you really have to weigh the cost and benefit. Uh, lastly, the link, uh, I would just like to round off the list of links so for processing. Uh, there's this post-harvest technology needed as a result of the unpredictable rain. So it's a private, it should be a private initiative and for marketing, supply scarcity, which would necessitate
facilitate the promotion and support of cooperative groups, which should be both public and private at risk. So this is a simple cost-benefit analysis uh, of uh, an adaptation strategy uh, being used for quality. So uh, my student more or less uh, estimated the increase in productivity based on um, facts given to her by her respondent. So she found out that there was really an increase in productivity after the funds were installed. So it's not shown here, but actually uh, the funds were installed starting 2005. No, but unfortunately, the owner of this farm was uh, just started uh, recording data uh, 2010. At any rate, it, can, it is clear that there was really additional revenue as a result of the installation of electric funds. Despite the cost, uh, and the cost here is more of the fund purchase, you know, 450000 in 2005. Okay, before I go to my mini case results, I would just like to share that um, I found that there are climate change initiatives in the Philippines, uh, both private and public led. So for private, uh, as well as international organization led, and there's also um, government participation here. I was uh, a speaker before in this uh, disaster, this reduction management is everybody's business. So it was a training course for the private sector. So more or less, there are uh, initiatives no? uh, being done to help the private sector be more climate um, resilient. And then BTI piloted in 2014 a program uh, which consists of trainings and seminars that will enable SMEs to be disaster resilient. Okay, many cases. So I tried to uh, cover six companies, but actually the six company is composed of two units of the company. So uh, there are two banana farms, and then uh, there are three growing fruits and vegetables, and then the last one is uh, into cacao and uh, goats and also cows. And um, they have an uh, agri-tourism um, business, Malagos Garden Resort. Okay, so these are just the facts. I won't go through all of this. This is just to give you an idea of the scale of operations of each enterprise. So Bison Farms, 100% Filipino-owned. Um, they Their plant capacity is 1,400 boxes per day. So these are their business units. But this conval was already closed, with, and this is the biggest. Uh, this was what was happened during Typhoon Pablo. No, these are this is what happened to 500 hectares of bananas. So look at this. So, so uh, by this time the flood had already subsided, but still, uh, no. Uh, damage was out of the question. No, the repair of the damage was out of the question. So this is a picture of uh, some housing and no, uh, equipment, storage areas, which were also damaged. Okay, plus their offices were also damaged. So this is just a screenshot of a headline. No? Uh, this is just to emphasize that many were um, no, became out of job after um, Pablo. And this includes those who were employed by the 500 hectare plantation of diesel farms. Okay, so what happened? Uh, and this is just talking of Typhoon Pablo. So the banana trees were uprooted and they call, uh, or fell down, they call it pip overs. Plus, there was the overflowing of Agusan River. And uh, when there's flood, there's this big possibility of Panama disease proliferating. No? Because water can be a carrier for Panama disease. And Panama disease is, uh, is fatal. No? So you will see later on. 
uh, one picture of a banana infected with Panama disease. And then uh, this one was an unexpected uh, result. Because of the displacement of workers, uh, security problems occurred in the four barangays covered by the 500 hectare plantation which was shut down. So these were the four barangays. So you, you can really see that uh, this um, mentioned earlier are really manifesting. Okay. And even if we're not talking of uh, extreme is an uh, extreme weather events, uh, you can see that even with the rainfall pattern, no, there has really been a big change. So I got this data from uh, the Havi farm of uh, Dizon Farms. And uh, in 2012, it really rained a lot from April to May and then December. But in June, it rained a lot from May to June and July to August. And then in 2014, the rainfall pattern changed again. This time, it rained more late August to September. So you can really see that there's this big effect on the rainfall pattern of, of climate change. Now, the Pandai Foods Corporation, so it compared to decent farms, it's, it, it directly markets its produce. And uh, they're really into uh, supplying big supermarkets in uh, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong. Okay, so what happened after Typhoon Pablo? Uh, in their case, they lost potential harvest from 1,500 hectares in Compostela Valley. And they were able, but fortunately for them, they were able to rehabilitate not their bananas because their bananas were not uprooted. So in eight months, at least, they were able to open, to start again their operations in this 1,500 hectare farm. So this is an example of a banana plant which is infected with Panama disease. So the leaves will turn yellow and then no, the tree will die. And then this is the third enterprise, uh, Ato Belen's farm. They're into fruit, vegetable, and spices. It is a relatively smaller business compared to the first two. Uh, so what happened, in their case, it's not Typhoon Pablo, but Typhoon Milenio. What happened was that their productive fruit trees became twisted, and this was eight hectares, and then their seedlings became soaked in water. So for Typhoon Glenda, what happened was about 90% of their trees in a separate eight hectare property were also damaged plus uh, several buildings needed repair so these are pictures of the damage wrought by typhoon glenda and uh, more or less uh, the sole proprietor brian Belen, who is a graduate of our department was able to give me specific um, data in relation to the impact of unpredictable weather pattern and increase in temperature. So this was what he said. Uh, uh, because of the erratic growth patterns of vegetables, there's a yield loss of 20% because of the delayed flowering of fruit crops, opportunity loss of about 20%. And their corresponding damages uh, in the case of livestock and poultry. So, uh, but it's more of cost related because there's a need for the livestock and poultry to uh, be given more water. So this led to increased water consumption. Gourmet farms, the first organic farm in the country. So uh, these were the manifestations of climate change, shorter summer, uh, and they grow lettuce, which thrives in cool climate. And then um, in 2014, as early as March, there was a typhoon. And uh, they observed that with, uh, with uh, the hot weather, there was this um, heat coming or emanating from the soil. Okay. Rosary fruits. 
So, we are into durian. So, we are into processing. And that they have an advantage in terms of um, addressing the manifestations of climate change. So, I would just like to show you some of their pictures. Uh, like, uh, this is uh, uh, what durian flowers look like. And then these are the durian fruits. Okay, so what did they share with me? Uh, they observed that uh, whereas before, before climate change manifested, uh, there was a low peak and a high peak in terms of durian production. But sometime 2014, the low and high peak periods produced almost the same volume of durian fruits. So they had to do something with the excess uh, supply during the February to May period. So it's good that they're into processing. So they really just decided to um, later on. No, there's a picture of uh, two processed products, no? uh, processed puree and uh, processed fresh durian. They call it frozen durian. So in their case, their adaptation was more in terms of product innovation. Okay, the last case, Puente Spina Farm and Malabas Garden Resort. Uh, so, as I said, the products are both and cow's milk, which they are using to produce cheese uh, because they have another subsidiary, Malabas Foods. And then, uh, they're also into agro-ecotourism. Agro they have a bird park, a butterfly sanctuary, and uh, a host of other wildlife species. So, these are the manifestations of climate change in the case of uh, Puente Espina Farm and Malatos Garden Resort. So, pneumonia among young goats, goats not producing milk, and the cows not liking to graze. And then the breeding behavior of uh, the goats changing from during the day to the night. And then there's also an effect of um, too much rain as well as long dry spell on pasture development. The grass would turn yellow in both cases. And then with the unpredictable rainfall pattern, they also had to water their uh, established pasture no, in the late afternoon. Okay, so this is a summary of the climate change manifestations in the case of the two banana farms. I have I had mentioned the manifestations earlier. So I tried to uh, separate the, the effect on operations by manifestation and then these are the effects on atobilence for main farms and rosary cruise operations. So again, uh, this is just a summary. And then uh, this is, I just separated Puente Espina Farm and Balagos Gardens. These are all the manifestations and at the same time the specific impact on the operations of each manifestation. Okay, so these are just some pictures of the climate change adaptation strategies. So in the case of uh, Bison Farms, they use bamboo poles to crop up the banana. Uh, so just in case another typhoon comes, but they're not expecting that uh, in the coming years. So, uh, but they're more concerned with strong winds, so they have at least these bamboo poles. And then they're also uh, trying to use um, sacks to cover the bananas, no? uh, so that when it's too hot, the bananas will get sunburned. So these are the weather reports that uh, the, um, the operating manager has uh, she has started discussing this with the employees. So uh, this is done every week. So they're more um, they're more concerned now with the monitoring weather forecasts and uh, discussing the implications of the weather forecast on their operations. They also have a, an emergency preparedness and response team. This is one of the ways they have tried to institutionalize climate change adaptation. So it's through. Uh, the organizational aspect. They also have an occupational health and safety committee. Uh, they have also posted posters like uh, how to deal with heat stroke. And then uh, this one, this is not 
from the papers, but this is what we are doing. Uh, they have more resources. So what they use instead of bamboo poles is uh, they're into aerial guiding. They have cables and they use number poles. So this is the one which, um, no, uh, which is um, connected to the banana trees. So uh, farm is also sometimes a problem with cold weather, but uh, they, no, they are uh, counteracting this with the use of this truck mounted swing. Now for uh, Alto Belen's farm, this is what they are doing. They are uh, they. They protect their crops from intense heat and pests through net hoops or shade tunnels. So this costs around 2,000 pesos, but uh, considering that for a 10 square meter plot, they can get 4,000 and this one is recyclable. So more or less the investment is worth it. And then this is the tank where well, what they have done is for their natural pigs, they are into natural pig farming. They mix EM, effective microorganisms, in the water, which is distributed to their pigs. And they are also into more natural means of uh, climate change adaptation. They are resorting to multiple root stock grafting, no? uh, which is a cheaper way of um, no, uh, combating strong winds. And then at Bermuda uh, Farms, they have this greenhouse innovation, which when wind comes in, the hot air is pushed out. And then they are also using their vermic compost. And then they also have a wind mill. So at least this is also um, an example of an opportunity which no, arose as a result of climate change. They are using the strong wind, no? they're capitalizing on the strong wind as a source of energy. So uh, this one, no? as you can see, they also have the net hooks, but uh, what I want to highlight here is more of the, or more of the mahogany trees in the background, which they use as wind rain. So this one is for Rosario fruit. So when they have surplus durian, they just, try to produce more and more this frozen durian and it's one of their best sellers. And then they also process some into puree, which they sell to processors. Uh, this one is in Malagos Garden Resort. They have a impounding plant, which collects waters during uh, strong uh, rains. So at least they are recycling water. So, and these are some of the cacao clones that they use. They have started using shorter cacao uh, varieties. And then uh, they're into the trash alley. Now this is just an illustration of the trash alley. So they say that the trash somehow nurtures useful microbes and insects. And then they have built canals. And they also uh, use sun groups so that there can be processing even when it's raining. They're, they can still do primary processing of cacao. And uh, this is an example that they have also capitalized on climate change. Uh, in their bird show, which is uh, very much uh, viewed by school children who go there on tour, uh, they have incorporated climate change in their script. So they're the title of their storyline is Climate Change and Disaster Based Mitigation. And the birds that are used in their interactive bird show are um, rehabilitated birds. So this is just a summary of all the climate change adaptation of the subject enterprise. You can see that most of them are engaged in low-cost weather protection systems, uh, Rather, they have installed low-cost weather protection systems. They're into IPM practices and uh, also infrastructure weather protection systems. So these are the more popular climate change adaptation strategies. And uh, I would just like to highlight some climate change adaptation strategies in the other points or links of the value chain. Um, in the case of Lapan, by the use of refrigerated vans, processing as you have seen in the case of Rosario Foods and 
uh, cold storage, also in the case of preserved foods. And you have all seen that Bison Farms has really somehow institutionalized uh, climate change in their company. So they were uh, the most proactive in terms of uh, adopting uh, enterprise-wide adaptation strategies. Okay, summary of results. In terms of the production operations, aspects, climate change effects can be classified as physiological, operational, and cost-related effects. This is what I found in my um, secondary and primary data collection. Climate change manifestations can also have indirect effects, such as in the case of the proliferation of pests and diseases, soil erosion, and soil nutrient depletion. I also found that timing of operations, farm operations, is really affected by manifestations of climate change. And this, in turn, has an effect on crop gestation period and the quality of produce. I was also not really expecting that the incremental changes in climatic conditions would lead to substantial losses, but it really did. You know? So this was an unexpected result for me. And uh, there was really this erratic growth of vegetables, delayed flowering of fruit crops, and heat stress among livestock. And then I also really uh, found that the impact of climate change is manifested in all aspects of the climate of the value chain. And um, as you saw earlier, the response of the business sector to climate change in Southeast Asia and the Philippines is not as comprehensive and proactive as those in developed, as well as developing countries, as you saw in uh, Australia. So I will not enumerate the different um, technologies that they adapted. So another observation, there were common strategies among those of the same scale of operations, as you saw in the case of quality earlier. Also, the degree of integration of climate change adaptation into Philippine agribusinesses for enterprises for strategic business planning and management processes is more in terms of operations. Uh, there was not much farm financial management strategies. It was only in terms of diversification of farm income and product diversification. Uh, also, um, among the different enterprises, uh, the Pandai was the one which heavily invested on technological developments. And again, perhaps this is because of their scale of operations and their uh, connections. Another finding, the climate change adaptation strategies of the smaller enterprises illustrate that adaptation need not be as laborious or expensive and increased resilience can be attained through low risk and low cost measures. Also, having processing capability, as in the case of Rosary fruits, can serve to reinforce climate change, the climate change adaptive capacity of a production oriented enterprise. Generally, the agribusiness enterprise's responses cannot be totally considered as company wide. Uh, so, um, many are somewhat more of ad hoc adaptive responses. And, um, there were attempts by all enterprises to incorporate strategies in some core processes. But these were only for specific functions per core process. And these on farms, as I was implying earlier, can be considered to be the most far along where institutionalization incorporates strategy of climate change is concerned. But it's also perhaps because of the damage wrought by Typhoon Pablo. I think they got really traumatized. So maybe that's the reason. So, but Lapandai can be said to be the most proactive as far as climate risk preparation is concerned, uh, especially in terms of incorporating climate change adaptation uh, across the different links in the value chain. And it was also um, the only one uh, exploring insurance <coughs> options, plus the only one which incorporated climate change in its r &D. because it was when I looked at all the researches, they were really working on um, climate change related researches like uh, that of um, trying to address Panama disease. And when the Espina farm 
has an advantage in terms of networking, as I mentioned. Uh, in fact, uh, they had connections with Ateneo uh, University in Davao, and uh, there was a project, a weather information project. So it can be said that they had an advantage in terms of networking. So even in cases where some climate change responses were in place, they were, up, they were usually concentrated on selected core business activities. Okay. So again, it's only Labandai, which really, uh, which try to incorporate uh, climate change strategies across the different functions. So there seems to be limited awareness of the strategic need to invest in building adaptive capacity among suppliers and customers. And uh, in the case of Lapatay and Dixon Parks, they really, uh, I, it struck me that they were not that concerned about the plight of uh, the farmers who were displaced as a result of Typhoon Plato. So good agricultural practices can be considered as climate change adaptation strategies. Uh, opportunities, again, um, there were some opportunities. You saw that in the case of Malagos, uh, garden resort, not they made use of climate change uh, in their uh, interactive bird um, presentation. And then in the case of Atobilens, they came up with a financing innovation to construct greenhouses. Uh, and then you also the product diversification opportunities taken advantage of by Atobilens and Malagos and also Sari Foods. And then the capacity of a company to respond adequately to climate risks is observed to be affected by internal determinants like organizational size, access to resources, and the extent of leadership in addressing climate adaptation. And there are certain climate change adaptation technologies which entrepreneurs can tremendously benefit from, but they either lack financial resources and or lack information related to financial assistance. And uh, companies in countries that have recently been subject to the effects of extreme weather uh, were those which demonstrated a higher, high awareness of threats associated with climate change. In general, agribusiness companies and enterprises do not seem to have a business continuity plan, only a business rehabilitation plan. And there is much room for improvement where government and private insurance programs are concerned. And the constantly changing climate has resulted to agribusiness entrepreneurs and managers uh, engaging in short-term planning, planning. And I think this is going to be a fact, and this suggests that there has to be a training on short-term planning. So for recommendations, I will just emphasize the more important ones. Um, climate change adaptation must be a key long-term business strategy and must at least be made a part or must at least be made a part of the overall business strategy and must be reflected in all the core business activities in the value chain. So I will just skip some slides in the interest of time. Uh, but uh, these are the general ways of incorporating climate change in the overall business strategy. So uh, when you try to come up with a strategic plan, make sure that uh, climate change elements are incorporated in the resource al allocation for R&D, production and marketing. Make sure that you have task forces and then make sure that uh, these and opportunities are reflected in your documents. Make sure also that there are accounting systems for tracking costs and benefits related to climate change and this also uh, is related to um, really have, having an in-depth study of the effect on productivity of um, livestock, of uh, climate change, and then um, also communicate with the public and policy makers about the need to address climate change. This one is a manifestation also of uh, one's effort to incorporate climate change in the overall business strategy. So, I would just like to share this framework. I encountered this. There is this uh, business adapt framework. So adapt stands for analyze, develop, assess, prioritize, tackle. So and specifically, not there are specific questions, but I won't go through all of them. 
I will just give a copy with the organizers of this ADSS so uh, they can just share it with those who are interested to uh, get hold of the list. So all of this will enable companies and enterprises to incorporate uh, climate change at all links of the value chain. And then there's an example for uh, agriculture. No? How do you incorporate uh, climate change in all of the links of the value chain? Okay, so for support institutions, I will just make this short, uh, provide robust weather and climate data in a usable format, presented in a format that is relevant to their particular locations and industries provide data related to the effectiveness and cost of adaptation measures and economic analysis uh, based on um, data of the various uh, adaptation options available to business, add adaptation strategy components in DRRM because I observed that uh, it's more of emergency preparedness and not really about uh, minimizing the impact of, of um, disasters on agribusiness undertaking. So I think there has to be a component which addresses this need. And there is a need to replicate the climate change adaptation program for SMEs. Not, it should not only be region 11. Uh, among the government agencies, there is a need to incorporate climate change context scenarios and to really incorporate climate change in strategic plans for agricultural commodities industries. For bananas specifically, there's a need to establish a banana research institute specifically to address Panama disease. Uh, this one I saw in one of my references. So there can be this modified government insurance subsidy support and incentive programs to influence farm level risk management strategies. Uh, I also saw this. There can be the changing the types of land uses to those which are more appropriate to the change local climate conditions. And then there can be more techno farms to showcase short-term cash crops that could help increase food sufficiency and uh, strengthen the climate resilience of affected communities. For academic institutions, the treatment of the courses, as well as students' resource researches, should reflect climate change realities. Um, and this goes uh, the, this holds true for agriculture, agribusiness, ag econ, and all other uh, agricultural uh, allied forces. Mm -hmm. So there has to be an emphasis on adjustments needed in production practices amid climate change, effects of climate change on the value chain, in making technical efficiencies. Uh, there could be such studies as impact of climate variability on production efficiency and incomes of uh, both farms. Uh, feasibility studies should include in its sensitivity analysis climate change related production losses or scenarios. Uh, again, there should be cost benefit analysis, climate change adaptation, uh, cropping calendar in the context of climate change, uh, risk involved in climate change. There has to be more studies on this. Uh, also, for food science, uh, there has to be the development of processing techniques and strategies to minimize losses due to climate change. And for the statistics, uh, students, applied math students, maybe they can help in trying to design financial insurance programs for agribusiness enterprises. And uh, I also think that there should be trainings, more trainings, so different institutions, including international institutions, can help in training entrepreneurs on business continuity, the value chain approach, short-term planning, uh, gap and climate change adaptation, and other different climate change related topics. So the last set of recommendations is there should be a mainstreaming of climate change in the global agricult uh, good agricultural practice global gap. No? It should be, uh, the mainstream should be strengthened. Organic agriculture courses should emphasize climate change adaptation elements. Insurance companies should develop uh, appropriate products, appropriate for those concerned adapt, adjusting to climate change. And companies themselves should exchange research results related to counteracting climate change related diseases among them. 